My next guest is a New York Times bestselling author. She is an advocate for us humans. She is an advocate for the animal. She is an advocate for the environment. She's been all over TV. And quite frankly, she is just a heck of a lot of fun. And she's got a brand new book out, 72 Reasons to Be Vegan. I can't think of a better reason to have her on the show today. Kathy Freston, welcome back to the exam room. Great to see you again. The pleasure is all mine. The last time you and I spoke was at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine in Washington, D.C., and I believe the first few minutes of the conversation were devoted exclusively to talking about shoes. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. Hey, first things first, you know? <laughs> right. We, we've got our priorities in order. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, congratulations on the new book. I was glancing through this uh, in advance of our interview today, and you came up with 72 reasons. And I was wondering to myself, I was like, well, how does somebody limit it to just 72? So how did you come up with 72? Well, actually, we we started off thinking like, okay, 10 reasons, you know, we thought it was going to be a concise 10 reasons. And then there are just so many other reasons that uh, were not overlapping. So we just decided to keep going until we we repeated ourselves until we didn't repeat to ourselves. And it just ended at 72. And uh, Jean and I, we wrote it for the ADD brain so that you could bop around. There's, you know, a chapter on sex. There's a chapter on uh, global hunger. There's a chapter on um, relationships and good skin. And then there's a chapter on, um, you know, diabetes. And so we kind of bounce all over the place because we wrote it for people like us. We have an ADD brain and we, you know, we didn't want to do like a deep, deep dive on everything. We wanted it to be very bottom line, uh, easy reading. So no chapter is more than a page and a half at the most. And it's just kind of a fun and easy read. And it oh. just stopped at 72. It is so much fun to read. And uh, ADD brain or not, was this designed for people who were already eating a plant-based diet and were in that oh, vegan community? Okay. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. This certainly is written for the person who is curious about a plant-based diet or they've heard the V word, they want to know what it is and they want to know more. But a lot of people like myself included, I'm already there, but I get asked all the time. So tell me, explain to me what the connection is between animal agriculture and climate change. And it's like, I think we're sometimes as activists, as vegans, as, as plant-based eaters, we're sort of expected to be, um, you know, uh, walking databases of statistics and numbers and all kinds of information. So this book was not only written for the person who's curious, but also for the person who's already there to say, here, mom, here's, here's why I'm getting enough protein or, you know, here, best friend, this is why it's connected to climate change. Cause I know you care about that. So we're hoping that it's, it's not only for the curious, but it's for the activist, the person who's already there and just doesn't want to answer the constant questions and just has a book to, to hand to people. And you cite so many credible studies in the book. So it is scientifically based, even though you've really kind of scaled down the language to, you said, a, a page and a half at most for, mm -hmm. for a chapter. How were mm -hmm. you able to take these studies and so, you know, concisely cite them when these studies themselves are hundreds of pages long and you're just whittling that down into a paragraph or two? Well, we just bottom line the material, we cite the study. So if somebody wants to go farther <laughs> and see how they conducted the study and the ins and outs of it, they, they can do that. And so we just cite the resources so that people know we're not just you know crazy because we do use casual language. We, we, we talk to the reader like they're a friend, like there's someone sitting in the room with us and we're just you know sort of chatting back and forth. So we wanted it to have that casual feel but be backed up by the science, but we didn't want to jam all the science in there. You know, I think that we all read so much as it is. You know, I read a couple of newspapers and then there's newsletters and then there's blogs and then there's posts and there's just so much you get bogged down by. So we just wanted it short, sweet, to the point. Here are the resources if you want to go farther. 
All right. Now, on the cover of the book, Dotsie Bosch gives this wonderful endorsement in which she cites her four reasons for going vegan. She said that uh, it was for her, it was saving money. It was for better, happy, fun time bedroom sessions. We'll just put that one in quotes. Uh, yeah. It was because uh, it's good for the heart and it's good for the skin. So now you've got her big four. What are your main ones of the 72 listed in the book? Oh, well, I came in through um, my love of animals. So that's my favorite. The, the reason is animals deserve better. So I know a lot of people are interested in this way of eating for health reasons, uh, you know, solely. And that's totally cool. So we give reasons on longevity, on diabetes, on heart disease, on better skin, all of that stuff. For me, I came in because I cared about animals. And so and then I discovered all the health stuff after that. Um, so my favorite is that one. And I also think that it makes your relationships really good. I think it is a multidimensional uh, lifestyle that when you are with someone who is on this path with you, there's a there's a bond that happens because I think I think when you know you are eating all this crap in your life, all this animal based food, you have to kind of numb yourself a little bit because you, you really can't think of where that food came from because, of course, you'd go out of your mind. So there's a certain amount of numbness that has to happen. Once you're not eating animals, it's like, okay, my heart, you know, I'm like open. There's a, there's a, there's a connectedness to my person, to the people around me, to the ecology of life. Uh, to the planet that just something feels more alive, crackling with life. And I just feel really good. And there's just when you're with somebody who has a, that sensibility of uh, not only a tenderness in their heart, but a, a fierceness to protect the vulnerable or to speak up for the vulnerable or to say, no, I'm not going to partake in that. I think it's just really sexy. And I, I think it makes a relationship really strong. So th those are my personal favorites, but then all the health stuff just makes me feel better and better and better about my decision. All right. Now I'm going to put on my invisible psychiatrist cap here, if there is such a thing. And I want to explore this space here because we get this question so often on the show. And that is with people who are transitioning to a plant-based diet, but the person whom they're with, their partner wants no part of it. How difficult do you think it honestly is for people who are on two completely different paths in terms of what it is that they're eating, their diets? How difficult is it for that relationship to continue to flourish? Well, it depends on the openness of the partners. I mean, you know, if you have a partner who uh, wants to understand how you experience the world, wants to see the world through your eyes and have empathy for the way you experience things, I think it's inevitable that that person is going to sort of be curious about what motivates you and perhaps take an interest as well. Uh, if they're not curious about how you see the world, how you experience uh, life, food, all of that stuff, it's probably not as strong of a connection. Not, I'm certainly not saying that it wouldn't work, but when, when, we, see, when we have a mutual respect to understand what motivates our partner and to really try to get inside of their skin so that we can know them even better. And then we have their back because we know what hurts them. We know what uh, makes them feel good and enlivened. Then, then it's kind of a natural thing that we're going to move toward each other. And those, that's a strong relationship. Yeah, it boils down to to respect and, and and as you said, that kind of openness. And that was kind of what happened with my wife and I is uh, I've told this story on the show a couple of times is that um, I, I went to her one day. I will never forget. I'm I'm in the kitchen and I'm like, honey. I'm going to go vegan. And she's like, what? You're already the healthiest eater. I know this and that, you know, and it was like, I'm just getting chewed out. I love my wife to death, but I'm just stating facts here, Kathy. So uh, anyway, I'm like, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to push pause on this and we're going to go and we're going to watch a documentary. And so I showed her what the health and she was like, honey, we're going vegan. And the rest was history because she did have that openness, that willingness to listen and to learn and to go on this journey with me. And I will say that it has made our relationship so much more rewarding. 
Yeah, it's really kind of cool. There's a sexiness when someone when someone is, remains curious and they're open to growth. I think that's a really compelling thing. That's that's something that makes me like per, a person, whether it's a man or a woman, a work relationship, a romance, you know, whatever it is, that curiosity to know more and to the willingness to change your mind and to see things you know, with sort of a new perspective, I think is very sexy and cool. I like that word sexy in this instance very much. Matter of fact, she just walked by the door and blew me a kiss. She's clearly oh. eavesdropping right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, I want to transition back to you and your transition over to eating a plant-based diet. So um, you wrote uh, so eloquently and concisely in the book that you were playing with your dog and you had kind of this light bulb moment like, aha, you know, like this is kind of what's going on here. And I can't continue to eat meat because my dog, it's no different than a cow or a pig or any one of the foods that I was eating. Was that more of a light bulb? Because I've heard some people describe it as a lightning bolt. Yeah, it was definitely, I would not say it was a lightning bolt because that would have required me to take immediate action. And I'm more of a lean in kind of a gal. So I I kind of slowly wake up to something and I sort of mull it around and everything. And I was, I was petting my dog and I, her little belly and her legs were up, you know, in the air. And I was saying, oh my God, I love this dog so much. I just love animals. And then this voice inside of my head said, well, if you love animals, why are you eating them? And it was like, dang, <laughs> that's inconvenient. You know, that's a very annoying voice of conscience. And um, so I, I started picturing her and I don't, I'm not going to give any, you know, traumatizing details, but I started picturing her in a slaughterhouse line and what it would be like for her. And I would, I would do anything for this dog. I mean, I just love her. She's like a child, you know? And I realized that the only difference between her and the pig or the cow or the chicken or the goat is that I know her, I know her intimately, but if I knew any of those animals, I would also feel like, you know, I, I would do anything not to have them go through this horrible thing. So I just challenged myself in that moment. I'm like, I, you know, I'm girl who grew up, grew up in the South eating every thing from an animal. I didn't think twice about it. I, it's like foie gras, fabulous, you know, steak on the grill. No problem. I love all of this, a bucket of wings, you know? And so the idea of not eating anything from an animal was quite overwhelming, which is why I didn't want a bolt of lightning. <laughs> I wanted a quiet <laughs> Hmm, I'm going to just sort of sit with this and think about it. And then I just challenged myself to lean into it. You know, I'm just going to take this one day at a time. I'm going to remain curious. I'm going to get adventurous. I'm going to go shopping with an extra, you know, half an hour so I can take my time at the grocery store, try some new recipes, try to go to restaurants and order different things. And over the course of a year, I became vegan. And so it's you dipped your toe into the water and then it's eventually a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more over time. I To me, it seems like the key for you was that even though at the beginning you were just dipping your toe, you were dipping it enthusiastically and with a lot of gusto. And I think that that's kind of the key here, because if people dip their toe with kind of this fear and this apprehension, Mm -hmm. it's really not going to work out. But you did it with enthusiasm. Am I right in in assuming here that that was really critical? I didn't do it overnight, but I was certainly enthusiastic. I uh, was excited and I was open and I thought of it about it like um, a sport, like, okay, this is a night that I would normally have a beef burrito. So what can I put in my burrito that is going to taste really good? Okay. So I'm going to do a black bean burrito. I'm going to have the same, you know, stuff on top of it, the salsa, the avocado, the shredded lettuce and all of that stuff. Nice cold beer next to it. Um, so I, I, I went about it with the spirit of adventure and sport, like, okay, what can I do here? And, and not beating myself up if I didn't figure it out right away. And that's why I just gave myself the time to, to, to get there gradually. I've never heard of going vegan referred to as being like a sport. And I think that what you and I need to do is get some more time, put our heads together and come up with a playbook and actually create a sport. 
sport of vegan. And I think that that one, that could rival the NFL. Kathy, I on. love that. <laughs> love that. That's very cool. That's very cool. Yes. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about that Southern upbringing. Uh, I, I too was raised in the South, Southern Virginia. And man, you want to talk about bacon grease with yeah. everything and just yeah. tons of beef and, and chicken and just all things fried. And if you're going to have greens, they're going to have ham hock in it, you know? So, totally, uh, totally. so yeah. So how, how fun was it for you as you're exploring this new vegan space to kind of take some of those Southern favorites and maybe find healthier vegan versions of them? Yeah. Well, I, I do believe in crowding out rather than cutting out. So instead of like saying, I'm never going to have fried chicken again, like what can I do that's like fried chicken? You know, what can I do if I want my cornbread? I want grits. I want all the, the buttery stuff. I, what can I do to have those things without like getting all the animal stuff? And so I, you know, did it. My Listen, my smoothie growing up, my protein smoothie was a uh, blender of milk raw egg and fruit that was my protein smoothie well, okay <laughs> so, hold on hold on hold on hold on you yeah, blended whole fat milk with a raw egg and some fruit like why the egg i mean were you just a fan of rocky what is going on there i thought it was protein i grew up you know thinking eggs were protein and like there was this thing about oh yeah raw eggs man and so i you know it was like this macho thing i, I thought and milk back then i was like oh milk it does the body good and i just was like oh it's gonna make me so strong i didn't know and somehow by the grace of god i did not die of salmonella poisoning. So there's that. I was young, I guess. So I survived. <laughs> I mean, goodness. Did that yeah. taste good to you? Like to me, that just sounds disgusting. Yeah. Well, it probably was. I don't even remember. I just remember throwing it back and thinking I was you know, <laughs> covered. So, so that was not an easy thing. I mean, a difficult thing to replace. It's like the protein smoothies that I have, you know, and just now have like nuts and seeds and all kinds of fruits and vegetables. And it's like really tasty, you know, right, right. It's like raw egg. Ugh. Much, much more memorable, you know, because we we are able to just kind of black out these portions of our life that really have served us nothing but bad. And I would think that a smoothie that has raw egg is definitely something that's going to be filed away in a lockbox in the brain, never to see the light of day again. My goodness gracious. Yeah. Yeah. I ate <laughs> everything. I, I ate everything. And my parents were like very proud to serve us good food, you know, and I enjoyed my friends and all that stuff. And, and it's been a, you know, it's, I went vegan. Uh, I started this process over 17 years ago. So I've been vegan for 16 years now. What it is now compared to back then, I didn't know any vegans back then. I knew maybe a few vegetarians, but I didn't have all the, the, the social network that I do have now. There's so many people who are either plant-based or vegan or leaning in or flexitarian. And there's so many great things in the grocery store. And, you know, I invite friends over for wine and cheese and crackers all the time. And they're always blown away by how the plant-based you know, cheese it just rivals dairy cheese actually is superior. So it's kind of fun. The social aspect of it has turned from like, oh my God, I'm all on my own. I don't know how to do this. You know, finding my way, navigating situations to like, people are really curious now. They've heard the words PB, plant-based. They've heard the V word. They want to know more. And now it's kind of like, oh, Good. You know, I'm not I'm not a weirdo. I'm 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 just sort of like, you know, a bigger big sister a couple steps ahead that, you know, I'm giving tips out to people and they and they're really enjoying it. So the 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 tone has changed hugely. And how rewarding has that been for you to be at the forefront of that? Because you have been banging the drum for virtually the entire time that, you, that you've been eating this plant-based diet, uh, mm -hmm. the V word diet. Um, and, yeah. and you really have been like out in front of this thing and talking about it so publicly and with that same enthusiasm that we were talking about for so many years, what's this ride been like for you personally? Well, I think, I mean, it's been really fun. I mean, I, I was married to someone who didn't go vegan. And so, and none of our friends were vegan. And so it was, it was a 
a bit rocky, you know, at first and, and um, just learning to entertain in a way that he was happy that I was, you know, I was okay in, in my skin that everybody felt respected. So it was a little challenging, but, uh, but now I, I kind of love it. Now I just feel like, uh, I feel like there's this huge community with open doors, open walls, and it's just very expansive and it crosses all political lines, all, you know, religious and all kinds of, you know, lines that does it's, it's like an, this open door club, you know, like this is really fun. And, and I'm, I'm just super excited to be part of it. It is a lot of fun and it is, it is a club with open membership and it's, yeah. uh, you know, and, and it, it's not just open membership. It's just like people who are open to making new friends and learning about different things and are all a bunch of nutrition nerds and environmental nerds and yeah. just want to like get the cleanest, the best science out there so that they can, you know, continue to make themselves healthier, make the world a healthier place and save yeah. a whole ton of animals at the same yeah. time. Very um, you know, to be around people like that is very empowering. You just feel like, oh my God, the world is going to be okay. We are, you know, there are some really amazing people out there who are uh, doing things and, and starting companies and they're entrepreneurs and they're opening restaurants and they're communicating in a way that, you know, it's just so breakthrough. So it's very, it's very, it's, a, and it's an exciting time to be plant-based, frankly. It really, really is. And, um, you know, it's, it, you talk about entrepreneurs. I was just reading this morning about this, uh, girl who I went to high school with and I knew that she was vegan, but I had no idea that she had quite the entrepreneurial spirit. She developed this eco-friendly vegan toothpaste pellets that you can actually pack with you when you travel. And so it's not even a TSA issue. And so with just a, like this minimal, like a, a few thousand dollars investment, I think she, the article said it was like $6,000. She's turned this thing into a multi-million dollar toothpaste empire now and it's just yeah look around at how many things come from an animal all the foods all that you know the materials so it's just like if you're a, a young hungry smart industrious person there is like a world of opportunity there are so many ways to start companies and really capitalize on this rising trend i mean i think in the last maybe two years I think two or three years, the uh, um, uh, the number of people who call themselves, who identify as vegans has risen by 600%. And that's just the V word. But then there's also flexitarian and people who are leaning in and all of that stuff and who are getting there and who want to get there. So it's like uh, there's a really broad base of consumers that uh, you can appeal to if you're someone who's interested in starting a business. I want to talk to you a little bit more about this book with a couple of minutes that we have remaining here, because as we said at the top, you really do cover all aspects of being vegan. And the majority of stuff like this conversation is really fun and uplifting. You do have these chapters about uh, men and how that benefits you uh, in the bedroom. You have chapters for women, the same thing. And you go into the science there in a page and a half. It's fantastic. It's concise. It's tender accurate. It's are, the tender bits are important. We have the to tender talk the tender bits are critically important, um, yeah. but but you have all of these chapters that are fun. You have a chapter about how cows respond positively to classical music, but then also you you have these more, I don't want to call them authentic, but real, 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 you know, hard hitting chapters that are like just serious, you know, like a chapter called working in a slaughterhouse is hell. And I mean, that is such an accurate statement. Was there ever a debate about putting that kind of uh, content in there when so much of the book otherwise is so uplifting and so positive? No, because I think it's important that a lot of people say, uh, you know, we need to protect workers' jobs. The same for we have a chapter on um, chicken farmers. It's, it's called um, Every Time You Buy Chicken, You Hurt a Farmer. And so we wanted to make sure that we are also advocating for human rights, for uh, human well-being. It's not just animal well-being. 
It is hell. It is hell to be an animal farmer. It is no joke. Uh, we we hear straight from this uh, chicken farmer, um, uh, third generation chicken farming family, the Barrett family, and they talk about how the industry is just set up to keep the farmers down and, and in debt. They can never get ahead. They never have health insurance. They work their asses off. They're such good people salt to the earth and they just can't get ahead. So the more we buy chicken, the more we want it cheaper and cheaper, the more the farmers are suffering and the slaughterhouse workers, you know, when the animal is processed, it is just a heinous job to have. And so we care about those people. We care, we, we care about, you know, we care about the land, the water, the air, the humans who have to work in these industries. We care about the animals who are just sort of, you know, completely exploited all the time. We care about the general population who is getting more heart disease and diabetes and uh, so much obesity. It's like, it's, it's one of these things that it's, it, it hits you in so many ways, when you start looking at how animal foods affects you as an individual and as the general population, it is stunning. So it's just a very empowering thing when you realize you can actually affect change. All right, let's pick this conversation back up. Uh, and uh, before we wrap things up, I just want to say thank you also for your chapter on uh, soy and one, how it's protective against breast cancer, putting those facts out there. But two, uh, the subtitle of that chapter is uh, it won't give you man boobs. And so uh, just as a man myself, thank you for helping to dispel that myth. <laughs> You're quite welcome. I mean, a lot of a lot of dudes are concerned with that. So we wanted to speak right into it and talk about the studies and the evidence and all of that stuff. We're certainly not like, you know, go soy. If you don't want soy, we don't care. It's not necessary for a diet. You know, if you want like it, great. If you don't, that's fine. But don't worry for your chest, whether you're a woman or a man, not to worry. Oh, that is a real fear for guys. I'm not even joking with you. That is a real fear. But the, the irony is that in doing the exam room, what I've learned is that it has absolutely nothing to do with soy. Moves have zero to do with soy. It has to do with primarily the abundance of fat that is in your diet. And where do you find an abundance of fat? In that standard yeah. American macho diet. Isn't that the ironic thing? Yeah, it really is. So much is, is ironic, truly. So much of it is like, oh my God, if you only knew. And so that's why we're like, okay, we're going to just tell it. So I know. now I you know. know. I know. Uh, one one little uh, quick housekeeping uh, question here before we do wrap things up here is I know that uh, you are a big time traveler. Uh, I know that you like to go places, you like to see things. And one of the things that I've always wondered, and I love to ask people who get out and they see the world is, where in the world are the best places to get good, clean, delicious vegan food? What are your top go-tos there? Oh my gosh. In the world? In um, the world. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite places in the world is Burma, Ma Myanmar. And I'm afraid I am not going to be able to go there for a very long time, but they have the most exquisite vegetables and tofu and sauces like you've never tasted before. And that's that's probably my favorite food. Um, I, I love Asian food. I've you know spent a lot of time in India and Cambodia, Vietnam. So I, I, I love Asian food. But then I'm, I, you know, love Italian food too. They have such great fresh vegetables and lentils and a glass of wine. And, you know, so, and I mean, almost anywhere you can get really great vegan food. I always, I always check, you know, the apps to see where I can go um, when I'm there and make a point of sort of vegan tourism like my own personal guided trip is just to find the best vegan food wherever i am and that's like the perfect trip for me i love that so much and maybe maybe that can be the follow-up book 72 great places to get vegan food huh oh, i number one researcher right here <laughs> <laughs> Love I love it. it so much. But this particular book, 72 Reasons to Be Vegan, and they are all absolutely fantastic. And the book's author, Kathy Freston, you too are absolutely fantastic. I could talk to you all day. So thank you so very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really enjoyed it.
If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.